this duality. In the absence of the duality, what is named this duality in the present article is just as interesting on its own right as the presence of duality. According to the discussion so far, duality is, a, is about the, rela the relationships between the epistemic and the ontic. What is this duality then? In a nutshell, this duality is about an excess of the epistemic or the ontic. The duality correspondence collapses when either of the ontic and the epistemic is excessive. To articulate what is really meant here, let us focus upon two case, cases of this duality and the following. One is caused by incompleteness and the other by non-commutativity, as in quantum theory. The former shall give a case of the excess of the ontic and the latter a case of the excess of the epistemic. As mentioned above, Completeness may be seen as a form of duality between theories and mod models. What the Gödel's first incompleteness theorem tells us is that there are not enough formal theories to characterize the truths of intended models concerned, or to put it differently, there are some models which are unable to be axiomatized via formal theories, where theories are of course assumed to be finitary or, recursive, or recursively axiomatizable and stronger than the Robinson arithmetic. The, the technical statement of this is that the set of stronger than Robinson truths is not recursively enumerable. If you allow for infinitary theories, you can nonetheless obtain a complete characterization, for example, of arithmetical truths and yet this is not acceptable from an epistemic, epistemological point of view, such as Hilbert's finitism. This is a case of this duality due to the excess of the ontic. We now turn, we now turn to the other kind of this duality. Let us have a look at a case of the excess of the epistemic. There is some sort of incompleteness in quantum algebra. The Gelfand the duality tells us there is a dual equivalence between possibly non-unital non commutative C-star algebras and locally compact Hausdorff spaces. There have been different attempts to generalize it so as, as to include non-commutative algebras and particular algebras of observables in quantum theory. And yet, as long as the duals of the non-commutative algebras are purely topological, this is actually impossible. The duality between space and algebra thus does not extend to the quantum realm of non-commutativity. This is indeed a case of this duality due to the excess of the epistemic. There are too many non-commutative algebras compared to the available amount of topological spaces. The disduality may be remedied to extend the notion of space so as to include, for example, sheaves of algebras in addition to topological spaces per se, just as Grothendieck indeed did it did in his scheme theoretical duality. In such a case, however, both sides of duality get more or less algebraic. The same may be said about the Tanaka duality for non-commutative compact groups, in which case duals are categories of representations and so fairly algebraic. There is another thought on the notion of dual this duality. No, can no, no canonical agreement exists on what duality means in the first place, even among category theorists as well as among philosophers. For example, some say duality is a dual equivalence, whilst others say it is dual adjunction in general. A weaker notion of duality could count as a kind of weaker disduality. In that case, we can see how far dual adjunctions are from, and yet how they technically always but practically sometimes transform into dual equivalences. The difference, the difference between dual equivalences and the dual adjunctions do matter, do matter from a philosophical point of view. 
think, for example, of physics, which may be seen as pursuing the duality between reality and observation. Re recall the state's observable duality above. If there is a perfect balance between reality and observation, that means there is a dual equivalence between them. Yet if there is more reality than can be re reconstructed from observation, then it is a dual adjunction, which is not a dual equivalence. Likewise, if there are more observa observational or epistemic differences than reality can metaphysically accommodate, then it is again a dual adjunction, which is not a dual equivalence. This is not just about physics, and there are, for example, subtle theories of different balances between states and observ observation in theoretical computer science. What this sort of uh, story tells us is, is that there can still be some sort of weaker duality, e.g. a junction, even in the presence of this duality, e.g. non-equivalence. From this point of view, the difference between duality and this duality may, may be considered relative and continuous, the transition between them uh, being gradual. This duality is not anything uncommon. If you have more models than theories, or you have more theories than models, you have this duality. You have, if you have more spaces than equations, can represent as solution spaces, or if you have more equations than spaces can distinguish, you have this duality. If you have more reality than, than language can express, or you have more language than reality can differentiate, you have th this duality. The entire, the entire enterprise of science is, in a way, about elucidating duality or this duality between formulae and solutions, i.e. Substan substantival entities satisfying them. Just as philosophy has centered around the dualism between the epistemic and the ontic. The, du the duality, this duality between formulae and solutions is crystal clear in logic and in geometry as seen in the formal correspondence between logic and algebraic geometry, and it further holds, holds up for analysis and physics as well. Given the Schrodinger equation, for example, we can think of the Hilbert space of solutions, which, inform, which informs us of the microstructure of the quantum un universe. What if the Schrodinger equation is nonlinear? You have just got an infinite dimensional symplectic manifold as the solution space. Given the Einstein equation, you can think of the manifolds of, of solutions, which still tells you about the ma macro structure of the relativistic universe. If there are not enough solutions to realize equations, or if there are not enough equations to formalize solutions, you have this duality. Otherwise, you have complete duality. And knowing about that is a gain in the enterprise of science, as Gödel incompleteness served as a fruitful, fruit, fruitful theorem for later developments in different fields. This duality is a general idea of the limit of the epistemic or the ontic. In, in Gödel incompleteness, what is incomplete is the epistemic, and yet in principle it can be the other way around. And indeed, it is the case in the quantum theory that what is incomplete is the ontic, or is the ontic as non-commutative tells us. That is to say, reality is incomplete rather than quantum theory is incomplete. Duality and this duality are not fancy rhetoric, but, but they do pin down the fundamental meaning and limit of the scientific enterprise. Although, although this sounds like a bold claim, nonetheless, it is arguably supported and to some extent justified by numerous cases in, of science in which duality and this duality play central roles. We can even shed, shed new light on the so-called frame problem in philosophy of artificial intelligence from the this duality point of view. It is concerned with the fundamental it is concerned with the fundamental limitation of the computational theory of mind, 
my abstract formulation of the frame problem is as follows. Dimensions, dimensions of reality are possibly infinite. Need a finitary frame to reduce possibly infinite dimensions and to identify the finitary scope of relevant information. Need a finitary meta frame to choose a frame because there are possibly infinite, infinite, infinitely many frames. This meta frame determination process continu continues at infinitum. Here, every frame is assumed to be finitary, as every formal system is, is assumed to be finitary, i.e. recursively axiomatizable in the, in the standard formula formulation of incompleteness theorem. This argument applies to any sort of finitary entity, and so if the human is a finitary entity, then it applies to the human as well as the machine. What is essential in the frame problem is the finitude of beings. From this point of view, the frame problem is about the fundamental disduality between the finitude of beings and the infinity of reality. Gödel incompleteness tells us there, are, there is no finitary means to characterize stronger than Robinson arithmetic truths. More formally saying, the truths are not recursively enumerable. enumerable. And the finitude of beings is rooted in the temporality of beings, as Heidegger says. If temporality is ignored, the intelligent system may compute for an infinite amount of time, and hence no need for singling a finitary frame out and for being worried about the frame problem. Or if an infinite frame is allowed, then there is no frame problem anymore. The same happens in incompleteness. If an infinitary system or infinitary computation is allowed, there is no incompleteness anymore. That is, there are, there are, there are complete systems characterizing the truths. The finitary assumption is crucial in both phenomena. It may thus be said that the frame problem and Gödelian incompleteness are essentially the same phenomena. In notorious Lucas Penrose's argument for the impossibility of inter artificial intelligence on the ground of incompleteness has already been much criticized by many, e.g. by Feverman. In my op opinion, there may, they may be wrong about the impossibility of an artificial intelligence. However, their overall point seems to be something similar to the point of my argument above, or at least my possibly biased interpretation of their argument is, is so. The Lucas Penrose argument is essentially about the limitation of the computational theory of mind, and it could be adapted so as to be applicable for the computational theory of the universe or the so-called information physics. If anything or any mechanism in the universe allows for solving incomputable problems, then the universe cannot be computational, i.e. any computational system cannot simulate the universe. If it can, that means the computer can solve incomputable problems, and this is a contradiction. Also, the corresponding version for the computational theory of mind, there are many versions of the Lucas Penrose argument. If the, arm, if the human mind can solve indecidable problems, it cannot be computational. I.e., there is no computational system to simulate it. But another way, artificial, artificial, Artificial intelligence is impossible. What is crucial here is that if the human mind can solve indecidable problems, then there is a something in the universe which can compute incomputable problems, and thus the universe cannot be computational. That is, if the human mind is more pow powerful than the computing system, the universe cannot be simulated by the computing system because humans are part of the universe. The last point may be put this way. If artificial intelligence is impossible, information physics is impossible too. too. So it exposes an interesting, unexpected link between the impossibility of artificial intelligence and, and that of information physics. And, and all this is about the fundamental disduality between finitary beings 
and infinite reality. This completes the discussion on the trichotomy of dualism, duality, and this duality. And this is the final section for concluding remark, the logic of this duality in the Kayato school. This is the final section for concluding remarks. Notwithstanding, I would dare to address yet another facet of duality rather than to give boringly superficial wrapping up conclusions. No one would ever imagine categorical duality relates to the Kayato school of philosophy. And nevertheless, it indeed does, as I am going to argue in the following. And the argument is really simple, I would say. We have started the, the discussion with the understanding of modernism as the disunity of modern worldviews, which is actually shared by the Kayato school of philosophy. The Kayato school's ideal of overcoming modernity precisely lies in going by, by, beyond the disunity of worldviews. Via integration of Western and Japanese Eastern slash Oriental thoughts. Indeed, Nishitani, a member of the Kayato school, says that modernization has divided our worldview into three conflicting ones. The nature one, the nature centered worldview, two, the human centered worldview, and three, the God centered worldview. It may be said that after the loss of global order or global meaning, which is the major characteristic of modern disunitism, the cosmos as a holistical, holistically united whole has become the universe as a physical entity. And accordingly, cosmology has come down to mere materialistic studies on the universe. Although some argue for the value of this unity as the Stanford School indeed does, nonetheless, the Kayato School regarded the construction of a unified worldview as the fundamental challenge of the contemporary era in Nishitani's terms. This sort of ideal uh, for unity may be traced back to the even older um, Aman Nishi's program interweaving a hundred sciences. And it would be fair to say that it has been a distinctively Japanese ideal to integrate the Western system, system of knowledge and the Japanese East, Eastern or Oriental one. Yet at the same time, the Kayoto school of philosophy of overcoming modernity is naturally interlaced with the problematics of modernity, modernity in the Western world in many respects and in astonishing and in astonishingly substantial manners. For instance, Nishida, the central founder of the Kyoto School, attempts to overcome the division of sub subjects and objects on the basis of his, of his theory of pure experience. And his problem problematization of the subject order dichotomy is exactly the same as Berman's in his enterprise of re-enchantment. The philosophy of the Kayoto school has centered around the re resolution of dichotomies. This would already suggest it may somehow relate to the, to the idea of this duality. And the, yet, if we look at the Kayoto schools of logic, which is never meant to be mathematical logic, apart from the early philosophy of science by Tana, Tanabe, who paid a lot of attention to the developments of mathematical sciences, the, compelling, the compellingly tight relationships between the duality and the Kayato school would have become crystal clear. Major members of the Kayato school have endorsed the common logic of absolute nothingness, including Nishida and Nishitani. It is also called the logic of topos in Nishida's philosophy. The logic of nothingness is, is, is inspired by both Japanese, Eastern, slash Oriental philosophy and Western ones uh, such as Hegelian dialectics, dialecti, di, dialectics. And there are actually diverse accounts of it, some of which might not be equivalent. Here I follow Nishida's account in his treatise, treatise entitled 
absolutely contradictory self-identity or absolutely paradoxical self-identity. The title is hard to translate into English. The former is adopted more frequently than the latter. Here, there, here, they, uh, here he addresses uh, the absolute, uh, the absolute, absolutely contradictory self-identity between unity and plurality, arguing, arguing that that this is the right way to conceive of the world. The details of the argument do not matter here. And what does matter rather is the pattern of his logic. He then, then relates it to the absolutely contradictory self-identity between appearance and reality, to that between subjects and environments, and to that between the mechanistic view and theological view. And he further repeats again and again that absolutely contradictory and self-identical self, self-identity logic for different dichotomies, the dichotomies in the same article and elsewhere as well. The same pattern can be found in other Kyoto school thinkers' uh, writings. Given a dichotomy between two things, they resolve the conflict of division between them by means of equating them. This is the simple structure of, of the logic of absolute nothingness. You would, of course, wonder why this is justified to equi- equate them. There are some complex arguments for it, yet from a contemporary, contemporary point of view, we can appeal to the duality to equate them. Duality is precisely the means of equating two things whilst keeping them different. And this is the fundamental reason why the logic of duality shares the same structure as the logic of absolute nothingness. In the face of the conflict, the vision dichotomy between two things slash views slash terms, there are different strategies to treat them, to treat it, possibly including not doing nothing for it. One is Hegelian dialectics, that is to find yet another global thing slash view slash term as encompassing both of them. Another would be Derrida's deconstruction, which attacks the con- condition of possibility of conflict, division, slash dichotomy, ter- thereby, thereby this- deconstructing it in its very foundation. And yet another strategy is duality or the logic of absolute nothingness, which does not rely upon any grand narrative such as Hegelian synthesis, and which elucidates absolutely non-contradictory structural identity between them. In, par- in, particular, in particular, philosophy tends to differentiate and oppose positions, and there, there has not been much attention to looking at structural similarities between different philosophies such as realism and anti-realism. The realist conception of space and, and, and the anti-realist one are provably equivalent. The realist conception of meaning and the anti-realist one are really arguably equivalent, as model theoretic and proof theoretic semantics are categorically equivalent. These are exactly the same sort of enterprises as the Kyoto School undertook for different opposing positions as addressed above. Duality and the Kyoto School are united at this cardinal point. Ending.